Okay. I think we are probably ready to start at this stage. Um, so I hope you all had a good day and lunch and everything today. Seems like it's been a great conference so far. Um, my name is Manfred Moser. I'm here with Sonotype, and I'll be presenting about improving software quality using compo what we call component lifecycle management. And of course, you want to do that with Jenkins, right? Just before we start, just a little bit about myself. I'm an author and presenter. I've written parts of Maven, the complete reference. I've written the Hudson book, and I write regularly on repository management with Nexus, keeping that up to date. I present a lot about Android development at conferences like NDEFCON and Android T TO, and then also OSCON. Um, I'm very much an open source believer and contributor. I'm running the KSOAP Android project. I started the Maven Android SDK deployer and still run that, and I'm a core committer on the Android Maven plugin, and I help with RoboChoose and all over the place, basically. Um, I'm doing training for Sonotype uh, for Maven and Nexus, and you can flog me on Twitter on at Simplicility, which is my website as well. <coughs> Comes from simplicity and agility, if that can be combined. But let's not talk about that. Me, let's talk about component lifecycle management. This is the version for managers. So what is it about? It's about analysis, control, and monitoring of component-based software. That sounds awesome, right? Well, let's get it straight up. So what are we talking about for us normal developers here? No marketing speak here. So what's a component? Well, it's about the notion that nowadays when you build an application, especially in the Java universe, there's a myriad of awesome libraries and frameworks around, and when you're actually creating an application, you're mostly putting the glue in and Im implementing your business-specific stuff, but you very much assemble all sorts of components. So those are the components we talk about. When we talk about life cycle, we talk about taking care of that application all the way from like you know conceptualizing it, touching your first source code, and then all the way to like getting it through QA into production, and then also while it is in production, you're not throwing it over the fence to operations and go, all right, have fun, guys. You want to keep monitoring it and know what's going on with it. So the whole way. And then management, when we talk about management, we're saying you don't want to like do that by hand. You have a tool that does it for us. We're software developers, right? We don't want to do things manually. We're lazy. We have a tool that does it. That's why we use Jenkins as well, right? So how does that work? Old school versus new school, right? It used to be typical that you start writing code, you write an application, but that's not so much the case anymore. Nowadays, when you look at any enterprise application or other application, even when you look at like, applications like Jenkins itself, the big bulk of the application is not actually code that you've written yourself. More than 80% of a normal, typical application is actually stuff that somebody else has written. You might be an co open source contributor, but you have not written like all sorts of components. You have not been involved in comments logging or logback or you know, you're know you using some sort of other pro open, open source components. You only written that small part and your application is comprised of all the bits together and you have to take care of all of that. We see that component usage exploding. Sonotype is running what's called the central repository, which is the built-in repository when you do a Maven build where everything gets downloaded from, and also Gradle and SPT and all the other tools are downloading stuff from. And we see five billion requests every year of components. And a typical enterprise application has hundred, and there's lots of them in each application. They are all built on, on components, and there is hundreds of thousands of downloads every year of those components. And they are used across applications. And when you build an application like that, you're using all these components on the one hand out available from the open source world, but you're also creating your own components and sharing them across your teams. And while you have all these component and they are all being used and it comes natural, right? Like you just go in your palm.xml, you declare dependency and whoop, there it goes and it's in your war and you're ready to roll. You really, to some extent, have very limited control over what your developers can pull in and use. And that's where things become a bit complicated. Um, open source is everywhere and even places like Gartner woke up to that nowadays, right? Like they predicted here in 
2010 that by 2016, more than 99% of global 2000 enterprises will be using open source components in their mission critical software. So open source is everywhere. Just look at the power of Jenkins and you know why, right? Can't beat that sort of model. And so this component-based software development approach is basically what's happening de facto. And that makes things possible that wouldn't have been possible a long time ago. I remember ages ago, I started to write a workflow engine in like, you don't want to ask what technology that was, but that's not something I would ever do today. I just like snatch up rules and go about it, right? And we have this power now available to us to reuse all those components and really stand on the shoulder of giants. But unfortunately, with using all these great tools, there comes a risk, right? Even those giants are just people like you and me, KK and others, they make mistakes too. There's security issues, there is things that you need to think about in terms of your licensing, intellectual property and copyrights, and your quality as well. So you need to, on the one hand, understand your own source code, but you need to also sort of take care and to some extent understand what all these other tools that you're pulling in are available. And you, you don't want them to negatively impact you. And unfortunately, or to some extent fortunately, the whole software development world is still very much an immature system, right? Like the industry hasn't been around since a few hundred years. It's only been like 50 plus years that the system is like software development as such exists, right? There's no shared security infrastructure. There's no update alerting. There's no standard licensing mechanism. And so the overall inf ecosystem of when you start using components is still very much immature, but because we have all these clever systems and we all like love uh, complexity to some extent, it also is very complex. There's a lot of dependencies and with the normal dependency management and then being automatically managed and being able to use a dependency of a dependency and those sort of things, um, things become even more complex. Just look at an issue like this, for example. There's a component Spring Beans, Spring Framework, everybody or most of you in here that I Java developers will probably know about that. There's a vulnerability with Spring Beans 256 that's known and has been uh, known for quite some time. And however, that knowledge is available in security vulnerability databases here under this number 2010-1622. But all the projects that use that component don't necessarily know that and the fixes don't automatically get propagated to these downstream components. You have to keep an eye out. And um, I can show you how you can see that in the Nexus repository server, which we are offering. When I do a search here for spring beans, which I've done before, but I can do that again, it will show me all the versions of spring beans if I go here. This is the search interface, and I can see here all the Spring Beans versions that it found. Is that big enough, by the way? Or should I make it a bit bigger? Yeah, that's too small. So you can see here all the available artifacts of the Spring Beans library in the central repository, and you can see the different uh, popularity, but you can also see here there's a security column here, and there is this issues with Spring Beans, for example, the 3.0 version, or if you go down to 2.5.6, you see here in the inside um, tab about this dependency, you can see here that there is this security vulnerability that's known and you can link to it and see that there is some security issue and it actually talks about that for version 2.5.6 before security update 0.2, that vulnerability exists. So when we look back here, we can actually see that with 2.5.603, there is no security threat anymore. But that's all nice and good. So now we can find that in Nexus if we're using that repository server. But really, it's great that I can see that there, but that doesn't really help me because my application has like a few hundred of those libraries and in my organization, I have a whole bunch of projects and there's all these classes and different teams and we consuming all these different libraries. 
And not only are we consuming all those and I can't dig through Nexus and find all these things, I also have the problem that, well, these libraries, they like release like a bunch of times a year. And so I, I can't follow it all. The, the, it's all like, it's just too much to take care of. And that's why these license, these issues keep sticking around and your software keeps having these issues that potentially affect you, but you're not even aware of that, right? For example, here there's a security vulnerability in Bouncy Castle and, um, or the no longer name of it is like the League of the Bouncy Castle or something. Bouncy Castle, which is a, a well-known and very widely used security uh, crypto library in Java. And it, there is a security flaw with that library, a level 10 security flaw, which means it's the highest security flaw that can be possible. And it has been out for three years a fix for that has been out for three years, but in the last year, about 7,000 organizations still downloaded that exact artifact from the central repository. So we know that people in their builds request them. So most likely a whole bunch of organizations still have this uh, library in their shipping wars or years or so on. And that's three years after a fix was available. So clearly, while lots of us like want to be secure, it's also very hard. So most of us kind of like sort of opt out on, on, on to some extent. Other examples, this really costs money, right? A like here there's a struts vulnerability that allows you to just go, if you see that here, it says Java Lang runtime, get runtime and then make directory and so on, right? And you can just pop that into a code. And that's a known vulnerability in, in struts, for example. So there is issues with security that you want to take care of, and obviously you want to have, don't want to have to read all the mailing lists and follow all that up manually. There's similar things with intellectual property. There's even organizations like GPVLviolations.org that actively goes after companies um, that violate the GPL and Arguably they should, right? Like the authors of the software wanted a GPL, so it should be enforced, that's fair enough. And similar, there's huge losses on, on software quality. With licensing, for example, it's, while it looks easy on the surface, with the component-based approach of building software, it's not that easy. On the one hand, there is all these different licenses, and that's already complicated enough, so you have to have that. But there is also, conflicts between those different licenses and beyond that you also have certain obligations in terms of the copyright that these licenses grant you. So what are some of the scenarios you could run into? So here's a scenario for a composite work, we're calling it Foo here in programmer speak, right? And this, this library is software is using a whole bunch of components. One of them is licensed under the ASL or Apache software license version 2.0. Another one is licensed under the Berkeley software distribution license, BSD. Um, but then another one of those components is using ASL, so the Apache software version 1.1. And then there is another ver library that we're using and that is using the GPL version 3.0. If you have a software like that, you cannot actually legally ship that software because you cannot subsume or like combine the a Apache software license 1.1 and the GPL version 3. But so by law, like legally, you can't actually ship that under any license. But in, under most circumstances, you wouldn't even find out about that, right? And I'll, I'll show you later why. Another problem could be that you're using a, a Apache software licensed software, but one of them down the dependency tree, if you look here on the very left sort of thing, there's a component like Neo4j or something that is a Faro GPL license, which means you can't offer it in a hosted environment. So it's very stringent license. Um, and even though you have you are on the surface thinking you're only depending on the on the assembly blah and, or bar, you are actually have to subs like follow the letter of the law for the AGPL in this course, and then that because the ASL does not sort of supersedes what the Afero GPL offers, so 
you have to be very much aware of what the different licenses are that does those components are using. And unfortunately, that's sometimes very hard to figure out. So you see, we have these huge benefits with um, what these components allow us, right? There's a lot of knowledge and know-how in there that there's no chance that we could ever integrate or like create all these components in time to make our software and write a rules engine and the workflow engine and the content management system and only that because we wanna implement some sort of website, right? Like there's no way we could do that. So there's huge benefits and I'd, I'd urge you all to use open source more than you are at this stage already. But you also need to be aware that when you do that, you need to be aware of what's happening and where that stuff is coming from. And um, if that software is mission critical or business critical, and I hope it is, it pays the money for your company hopefully, then you wanna make sure that that's okay. And so you wanna contemplate looking at governing what's going on with the open source software. And so we wanna help you with that. Unfortunately, we did a survey earlier this year and we found that there's a lot of companies that are looking and have some standards, like 43% of organizations that we asked and there was a big survey with a whole, a few thousand developers participating across uh, like various markets of uh, users, 43% said that they have a corporate standard, but it's not enforced. So it's basically a piece of toilet paper, right? Like, it's no good, right? If it's not enforced, then what, what, what is it worth? And then the 37% said, well, we don't have any standards, whatever, like, we just go, go take it and, like, run with it, right? And that might be okay now, but as soon as there's a security issue, so you might run into trouble, right? Like, we all know that fixing it, er finding it early and fixing it early is the cheap way to go about it. It's obvious, right? Like, why would you want to get it through QA and all that sort of stuff and into production and then have to fix it when the customer is on the phone and uh, is giving you the trouble? It's obvious, right? But who really does something about it when it comes to these issues where it's so complicated to actually find out what's going on with them. How can we deal with this? We could keep our fingers crossed, or look the other way, right? Hope for the best, or we could like really analyze that flaw and say, yeah, I know it's not secure, but we're not using it that way. It's not affecting us. So there's a whole way of dealing with it, but we hope that you not, don't end up in this situation where your boss will forever be on your back in the future and go, oh, you remember last time when we had that problem? Or worst case, you might have to look for a new job, right? We don't want you to end up in that situation. And luckily, you guys are all Jenkins users already, or I hope you are, and if not, I'd urge you to download it now and get going on it. Jenkins already takes care of your build, right? Why not let it worry about the licenses and the security for you as well. And that's what we are hoping to offer you. There's an Insight 4 CI plugin that can analyze your builds or like the output of your builds and give, us all, give, or give you some information. So let's, let's check this out. So I got a local Nexus build, uh, sorry, a no local Jenkins running here and I have the Inside 4 ci plugin installed. Um, it's available in the Nexus Update Center, so you can just go to Manage Plugins, go to Available, do your search for Insight, and then once you've installed it, do the usual, you know, tick the box, download, and so on, and then you'll end up with an Inside 4 ci plugin like this. You restart your Jenkins instance, and you'll be up and running. And now when I say up and running, what does that mean? Well, it means that in Manage Jenkins, you should see a sonar type insight kind of section, which you don't actually have to worry about at this stage. What you can, however, do is you can create a build or even change a build that you already have, go into the configuration of it, and then this is just a, a little example application that I built of AppFuse, a struts application. I'll show you later. You can add a post build action, which is an inside post build scan. And now let's have a look at those options we have here. So I added an application ID, which is something you don't need to add. That's if you want to have like the full blown report. 
but it will work just fine without it. Um, you can fail the build if there's any security vulnerabilities found. And then importantly, you can define what artifact we should scan. So in this case, this builds, this is an example application. It builds a web application and it puts it, it's a Maven build, so it puts it in slash web, that's the module target, and then it's a dot war. So I just go start at war, and that's what's gonna do the analysis. And then you just kick off a build and you'll get some results. So let's see the results. I can go here. And here the latest inside results would be looking something like this. But before I go and show you what the results are, let's, let's see what it actually does so you're not worried about it. So we saw the plugin manager. You saw that there's some global settings. We saw the build step. Those build steps are available in the Maven 2 slash 3 jobs as well as in the freestyle jobs. So you can do it pre or post anytime and you can do some configuration. Now when that build, when that plugin runs, what is it actually doing? All it does is it takes that archive, the war, jar, ear, or whatever, cracks it open, looks at all the jars inside, and creates a fingerprint, so just the SHA-1 sum. That unique fingerprint that identifies those jars is then all assembled as a list and sent to the inside service, which is a little is a web service that sits on top of the data uh, that we have available in the central repository, and it will produce matches and create a, a report that contains all the information we have aggregated in central. So we go about and read all the security license, uh, all the security mailing lists, and we look at all the databases, and we take all that data and we munch it all into central, match it up with the artifacts. And so when you send us those sums, we can just put them in, create a report, and we'll have a look at that report and create that in a zip and send it back to you. And that's all the plugin does. So when you think about how that works, you can understand now that it doesn't really matter how that artifact got created. I, I was using a Maven build here, but if you are using Gradle or Ant with Ivy or whatever, it doesn't matter. You can even theoretically put a static artifact in there it just has to be containing those components and they all do, right? So it's completely built tool agnostic. It's also very fast, like running a SHA sum, like cracking open a jar, running a SHA sum on a bunch of files in there takes no time at all. And it also doesn't have any like privacy sort of issues because your code is never actually being looked at. We just like take the SHA sum and send that over. And you can even configure that to exclude your package name, for example, if you have like com my company dot whatever, we can exclude that and then we don't even look at those charts at all, not even for SHA sum creation. So there's no sort of issues with that. And then once you've done that, you get nice results. So let's see what results we get. How useful is that? So this example application I built here is just a Maven archetype for those that don't use Maven. It's basically a template that the authors of, well, in this case, the AppFuse project provide that you can use as a base to start your own application. Now, when, we, when I created that project, I just built it locally, um, put it in a Git repository, and created a Jenkins job. That's all I did, and then I ran the inside check. And when you see here, you see that little web application that comes from the, it's, like, it's basically like very, very little code. It declares a few dependencies, but overall, it found that there's 57 components identified. Now that gives you a good idea, right? Like that web application, web application is a template. It has basically no code in it, but 57 components are already used. <coughs> Two of them happen to be having security alerts and 18 uh, happen to have license alerts. So let's check out what these license alerts are. When we look at the security alerts, we, are, we see here color-coded orange, red and yellow, sort of the threat level, eight to 10 would be critical, four to seven would be severe, and these numbers are what the open source vulnerability and the common vulnerabilities and exposures database are using. And so we're just mapping those in here. And then second of all, we have license information as well. So we see there's one copyleft license involved, two non-standard, five not provided, and then 10 weak copyleft and 39 liberal. So 
seems to be we're pretty good, but there's still some issues. So we, we should check it out a little bit more. So you can go in the components tab here and see what was found in those components. So we found that there's like Antler, AOP Alliance, ASM, you know, obviously a whole bunch of Apache Commons libraries like HTTP client and so on. And then all these components were included in that one little war ac application that came out of it. Now you can like look for those here, look for exact matches, found similar matches. There were just some that were sort of similar and unknown and propriety that you can also exclude. But obviously from the summary, we're more interested in what's going on with this one severe security issue. So let's have a look at that. You can go into the security issues tab component, and you can see here that this is the org.spring framework spring beans library again in this case, that is being used in version 2.5.4, and it's going back to be the same sort of issue in this case. And we now know that we could upgrade, but I could have triggered this to fail the build, right? You don't need to do anything, it just fails the build, and then you need to know, or then you know you now need to dig into this. When we now look into this, we also see that there's a whole bunch of more information available. Now let me make this a bit smaller. I'm not used to such a small screen resolution, obviously. <laughs> um, so you can see here, we have a whole bunch of information about this component here. On the one hand, there's the declared license. So any artifact that gets uploaded to a central repository has to say in the palm.xml file, I am Apache v2. But it is possible that they either declare something and then sort of semi-intentionally get it wrong, or it's also sometimes just happens that um, a code, get, a project gets inherited by somebody and so on over the history, something gets forgotten and there's actually one file in there that is a GPL license. And sometimes even the authors of the, uh, the maintainers of the project don't know that. But what we've done is we've gone in and looked at all the source files of all those libraries and and check the source header files. So we have a column here that says observed license, right? And that potentially you'd be surprised how often those don't match up. In this case, it net matches up nicely. Obviously the spring guys are doing their homework, but there's a lot of libraries where there's a whole bunch of different things than when you look into that. And that's why you wanna then potentially look after the licenses that you need to, that are fine with your business. And obviously they're different, right? Like, if you run a hosted business where you don't actually ever give the software away, you'll be fine to use GPL. Or if you run, or even if you ship your software, you might be fine to use LGPL if your legal department is okay with LGPL, and that depends on your lawyers, right? So some are, some are not. So it all depends. But at least now you have all the uh, information available. You can look in this panel here of how the, the component evolved. Here you see that in the 256 security update 02, the security issue down here disappeared, so it got secured. But then you see here in the 3.0 release, that same security issue was available again, or <laughs> was still there. And then they, they went all the way to the 3.03 release to fix it in the, th in the uh, next major version as well. When you look into these components, you can also edit the vulnerability and license data about something. So you could, for example, go in and say, all right, well, you failed the build this time. Then you go into your software, you analyze the use of that component, and you really assert that, yeah, it's not actually affecting us because blah, 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 blah. Then you could put that in here and therefore acknowledge it, confirm it or whatever, and then either do something about it in the sense of upgrading or at least making the build stable again so it doesn't fail again. So you now have that. On the other side, license information, same here, for example. We get an alert here about MySQL, the JDBC driver being used. Well, if you're just hosting it, then it doesn't matter, right? If you're shipping it to your clients, theoretically, that's not legal. You would have to tell your client to download the MySQL driver themselves, theoretically. I bet you lots of people don't do that, but that's a different story. So that's sort of what you have available, and with all this information, you can also have an audit log if something gets edited in terms of the license or the vulnerability, so you can really see what's going on. 
So you see, it's very easy to give you all this information. It basically comes for free. And then now you have these results. What can you do with that? Well, it's uh, out with the old, in with the new potentially, right? It makes it way easier for you as developers to have, a business, to, to have a business reason to upgrade libraries. Believe me, I know how hard it is in, from development to go to management and say, look, we should really upgrade to the latest version of this. And they're like, well, it how long does it take? Well, yeah, well, HTTP Commons, uh, HTTP client, for example, has API breakages, so it's going to take us three days. Uh, no, you can't do that, right? So you often get shot down and keeping your software up to date. But if you have the information at your hand and it was produced by you very easily with very little effort, you can use this as a business reason to say, well, we should upgrade. And that's going to make it easier and nicer for you to work. You can also use that as a reason to use certain libraries and not others because you really have all the accurate information at your hands now. That overall, the automation will save you time and uh, you don't have to follow the security mailing lists and announcements anymore. And you won't have to dive in and go about potentially rebuilding some libraries from source because you had to check them out and what's going on there. You get to concentrate on coding what you love doing, right? And create value for your business rather than worrying about this like security and license headaches. And that's what we wanna help you with, right? Get on to <coughs> on with what you love doing, and that's hopefully coding, or at least in my case it is. Now you might wonder, you're not running Jenkins or Hudson yet, what, what am I gonna do now, right? I, my builds are already out. Well, first of all, I would suggest that you start running Jenkins now. Second of all, I would say, if you're not using Jenkins or Hudson, but you are using a different continuous integration server, uh, don't worry, we are working on that for other CI servers. If you want to know which ones and let us know which ones you're after, let us know. But even if th those scenarios don't apply to you, it's still not lost. You can try what we call inside app health check and that will do the same thing for you, right? Remember how it worked, right? It just created those SHA sums and sent it to the server. So we have on that website here, um, a similar component that you can use right now. You, all you do is it downloads a little software that does the same thing. It cracks open your war, creates those shasam, creates those fingerprints, and then sends them to the inside service. Once it's done that, it, you get an email that has the same sort of HTML look that we had there, and you can do that same investigation of what you need to do right there with that email, and that's gonna help you a lot. You can do that if you have your application already in production, for example, right? Like you can check your existing application. Or another use case that I can think of is you're using this pre-built application. Say you're using a reporting tool like, I don't know, Jasper Server or Pentaho or something like that that, uh, that has for you bundled an application that is a war and that you are referencing with and working with as like via web service or something like that. Well, if you're running that sort of war, even though it's not written by you, in production you have to look after it as well. So you should probably be aware of the security and license issues that are caused by that. And so you can just upload that war and check and, let, and the same thing will apply. You will get all that useful information and potentially go back to them and say, look guys, um, I found this issue, can you fix it or whatever, right? So same tooling, very simple use case, but another nice way to do it. And this is what we're talking about with component lifecycle management. There's various stages, right? You wanna take an overall inventory, which is what we see in the Nexus repository server. You track the component downloads, you figure out what you use, what's in your supply chain. Then you wanna analyze that you see like in your repository, your server, you see all those components being downloaded and you start worrying, like, what's this for? And then you find out that some developer just, you know, started in his spare time by the side, you know, running, like, building other components that have nothing to do with what you're shipping. So you want to also analyze the applications that you are actually shipping and not just what's in the repositories. You then want to control it, so you want to be able to have licenses potentially create whitelists and blacklists and implement those controls and keep it as easy as possible to maintain that. 
And then last but not least, you need to keep monitoring that. With security issues, for example, we don't know all the security issues that are existing now on some component. New ones are being discovered all, all day long, all the time. Just ask the Oracle guys about the JDK 7 release train and they'll tell you all about it. Um, and when uh, such a new vulnerability is found and it affects you in production, you need to find out about it. You might not be running a CI server build anymore, but you need to find out about it. And that's where um, Insight for Nexus comes into place, which is another component that we're working on that will allow you to basically define, this is my released software, this is what's in it, and then you will automatically get notifications if new issues creep up and are found. And so we want to consistently take care of those needs for you. In terms of requirements for component lifecycle management, you want it to be precise, right? So you want to make sure that the components that are identified are, are unique and correct, and with a SHA sum, that's pretty easy to do. You can, in fact, use the SHA sum shirts on the central repository and find an artifact. You could go into a any old library, which is just, maybe it's called commons-lang.jar, and you have no idea what version it is, you can just take a SHA sum and use the, the, the checksum search on central, and it will show you the version, the exact coordinates of that artifact. And that's gonna make it way easier for you than cracking it open, looking at class files, and that sort of stuff. So that's an easy little, little trick that you can use. Once, you, once it is precise like that, you want to be able to do something about it. So it needs to be actionable, needs to be complete, so it needs to look at all your components, and we do that. Needs to be update aware, and it should work with the tools you are using. And in our case, right, it works with whatever build tool you're using. It, you can just upload the final artifact as well. All it matters is that we look at the final artifact. So we hope we have a practical solution for the whole entire software lifecycle with insights for CI for you like that. And what's next? Well, I'd suggest to try it out. It's free, right? You can just install it, run it, see what comes out of it for your application. It's very easy to configure as you saw. And let us know how you like it. And yeah, any questions? Um, so the, the over, okay. So the question was, what is free and what is not? So that whole summary view is completely free. Like the whole like running the analysis and all that sort of stuff is free. The whole summary information and the component overview is free. When it then goes to the security issues and license analysis, um, it's not free anymore. But I don't know the exact price cases. But you can talk to us afterwards. It's not very expensive. And like the the inside check of the online works the same. And I think like a check for one application is like a few hundred dollars only, so it's very cheap. But Jason is over there, he can help you with that as well. Insight for SAR? For non-Java binaries. Non binaries, so it's, it basically we have the information for everything that's in the central repository, and that is mostly Java, obviously. Um, I don't know of any plans of going forward with other artifacts. Nexus itself supports .NET repositories and like P2 repositories and OSGI bundle repositories, but all that security and license information is based on stuff that is in central. But for example, if you're doing JRuby sort of stuff, there's a lot of Ruby artifacts that are in the central repository. There's a lot of Scalar and Clojure, and there's a lot of artifacts in central, like way more than you would actually think there is but it's, there's not gonna be for a C library, for example. Although there is C libraries as well, but that's a different story. Okay, you were asking a question there, uh, that table? So it's the same question. Okay, cool. But yeah, if you're interested in like f this kind of sort of concept, the Nexus repository server just provides HTTP REST-based <laughs> interfaces and th it's completely feasible and like lots of people do that to have statically, like at .so files or other libraries that you keep reusing and assemble from in your Nexus repository server, it's just not common to have those artifacts in the central repository, so we don't have that information, but you could use Nexus to do that. In fact, lots of companies do that. They create like, you know, Android applications, for example, based with like 
native code and, and, and Android slash Java code and some Java libraries and all that stuff gets munched together in an APK and Nexus can host all of those. Any other questions? Criticisms? <laughs> Okay, so in terms of like looking and doing any static analysis of your own code, no, we don't do that at all. So that's a totally different beast and very like, you know, labor and intensive and stuff. And there's lots of tools out there already. And to some extent, while it is a very valuable service, thinking about that, like you write that code, you manage that code, so you're probably the expert on that code, but you're not the expert on those other 80% of libraries that you're actually using, right? And that's what we wanna take care of for you, right? And that's like obviously a very large bulk of what comprises the application that you need to support. So that's where we are at with that. What would be the action? Well, with the, for example, with the Spring Beans version, it would be easy, right? Like it says here that the version 256.seco3 is secure, right? So once you have that information, you can just upgrade to your dependency to like include those five more characters and you're done, right? But that is gonna be up to you, right? Like we give you the information, then what you base do on that is a different story. We are also looking at having tools available in M2 Eclipse that allow you to basically then have auto fixes and stuff on, on that sort of stuff. But that's also like still, like it's coming, but not available yet. Yeah? No, you don't have to have Nexus running. I just happen to have Nexus running locally here because I wanted to show that Nexus show, like all this information, like popularity, security issues, license threat is available in Nexus and it's based off the data that's in the central repository. It's helpful to be in Nexus because you can tell things like, I don't know, like if you look at say for example, JUnit and you look at the popularity of JUnit, where is that, hang on, let go. Like JUnit for example, you look at the popularity of JUnit you see the most popular version is the latest 4.10 release, but the second most popular version is a 5.4 year old version, 3.8.2, right? So that should give you some indication. And in many cases, it helps you to get this sort of indicative uh, data that, well, yeah, there's, maybe there's this great new library, like great version out, but then you see that the popularity is like way small compared to like one older version, well maybe that's because there's a security issue. So it can give you some indication of well we should maybe go out and check the website. There might be something they're just about to release the next security fix or whatever. So it, it is useful information. Also like if you look at things like GWT for example has some very, in I think it was GWT. Like there's a whole bunch of, yeah it's not here but it's very amazing sometimes when you look into the comparison between like observed license in the code and declared license, you sometimes you're like, how did that happen? So it can be very interesting to look into that. And if you got in, end up in that scenario, you probably wanna think twice of what you're using. Okay, well, if I bamboozled you all completely, then I guess we're done. Um, thank you very much for listening. Yeah.